um, you know, thank you for joining the AI and the Future of Art and Music panel today. Um, I'm your moderator today, Lorne Pfeiffer. Um, I myself am an artist. I'm a recovering venture capital investor, and I'm also um, a startup operator in the Web 3.0 space. Also a global shaper as well for the San Francisco chapter. Um, but I'll stop there, and, and I'm so excited to introduce our two esteemed panelists that have been so gracious to, to share their insights. Um, so I have with me today to talk about art and AI, Alima Fitisemanu. He is the co-founder and CTO of Fleur.ai. He has an impressive background from Stanford in technology, society, art, um, and then I also have all the way from Italy dialing in um, Alex Braga, who has an amazing career. He's an artist, he's a pioneer in AI, he's a creator of Ament. He's also the founder and CTO of Alive, the first Italian interactive streaming pl platform, excuse me. Um, so just a couple of housekeeping items. We will be having a, a 10 minute Q&A session at the end. So, you know, just pop your questions in there as they arise into the chat box and we'll get to them at the end of the session. Um, and we'll be having a discussion, but something really exciting before um, we dive into discussing is Alex has been so kind to share um, a quick snippet of, of some of his musical compositions with you. So um, before we dive into that, we will, um, have the chance to view some of his amazing work and working with music and AI. So, um, Ana Maria, um, let's kick it off. Bear with us for just a second. According to research published by some uh, media, in 2033, artificial intelligence will reduce humanity into slavery. Mark, Beethoven, and Mozart were masters of a brand new revolutionary technology, the pianoforte. In the last 120 years, more than 180 million human beings were killed by new technologies called weapons. Every single major leap forward in humanity has been driven by a new invention. The hammer is one of the most ancient known technology. The hammer can be used to build civilizations or to smash someone's head. Unfortunately, through history, we've made abundant use of both Education. Imitate. Knowledge. Data. Learn. Process data. Practice. Process data. Intellect. Process data. Wisdom Artificial Intelligence Spirit Artificial Intelligence Soul
against humans. It's us against us. It is us reducing us into slavery. The future is not tomorrow. It is what we're fucking up today. Wow. <laughs> Mic drop if I had one. <laughs> wow. Amazing. Thank you so much, Alex. For, Thank you very much. Thank um, you very much for having me here. It's a big honor. 
That's amazing. I would love to, there's so many questions I have, but you know, I, I want to get to some of the core ones first in, in that, you know, there's this whole realm now of artificial intelligence and art and music, right? Um, and everyone seems to have a different journey. There's like no one right journey because it's such a new field. And so I would love to know what drew you, Alema and Alex um, into the realm of art, music and um, AI. And Alex, if, if you would be kind enough to kick us off in sharing your story. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, it's uh, you know it's been a, a real journey, as you were saying, because I, when I started, I, I've always been a, a kind of a nerdish guy, and uh, I I've always done research, and I'm ex an experimental musician and experimental artist. So I was playing cars as well as guitars, as you can see, as well as pianos and computers and. Uh, um, uh, I've done things playing animals and plants and uh, everything that can be interesting in exploring. Uh, it's always been um, a very good interest to me. But then, as my as the show's um, um, concept uh, kicks off, the, the the very main concern was this big question that I've heard on on the media about five years ago or something like that about uh, the 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 evil presence of artificial intelligence in our life and 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 i always found that kind of uh, reading of our uh, life uh, pretty misleading i, I mean uh, artificial intelligence is just a very powerful tool that we can use to make our life better and uh, it, it's up to us how, how we use it uh, i mean i could grab that guitar and smash it in, into the, the, someone's head has with the hammer and that would result in a, an assault and a, in a weapon and a, in a broken head, or I can just grab it and play a beautiful tune and it, it, it will result in a harmony. So um, it's us producing harmony or or not. And, and since harmony is the, the only main concern that every one of us should have, we should we should focus on that. I'm, I'm, I've always, you know, I, I coded a mint, which is a, a one of a kind artificial intelligence, because it was the first kind um, of artificial intelligence working at a really um, super fast and really low level and able to uh, code and, and, um, and adapt to the style of the artist. So actually, it is it is not a, a, a generative uh, um, a kind of AI because I'm. I don't kind of uh, agree with that approach. I mean, I, I, I think the human should be at the centerpiece of the of the creation and the sense of life. And so we coded with uh, two professors, uh, uh, Professor Riganti and Professor Laudani of University of Roma Tre. And we've done a lot of uh, um, lectures with this AI. And once I met a professor uh, that, that said a very wise thing, and he said, one of the main problems about artificial intelligence is a marketing problem, is the name. Somebody dared to call it artificial intelligence. And, and that, that's where humanity went bananas. Because if they just, if they just named it uh, um, something like a, a very complicated chain of uh, uh, process that makes a human's life better, nobody would have said uh, uh, anything um, to um, obstaculate the develop of uh, artificial intelligence but you know we've um, we are smart uh, and and not very wise and so we thought that this could sell much better and so we called it artificial intelligence which now bonds very well with natural stupidity and uh, um, and so this is a very uh, important topic that we have to be aware and discuss uh, everything is Everything is in our hands. Uh, artificial intelligence is not taking away our soul, it's not taking away our, our privacy, it's not taking away our humanity. It's the use that we make of it. So everything is dependent on us. Everything is dependent on what we decide in the next five seconds. Everything is that my future is, is, is what I'm saying right now. It's not tomorrow, it's not in two days, it's not in one week, it's right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And that's like one of the, the concepts or the phrases that you keep hearing, like in, in nowadays across a lot of, you know, different discussions around AI is human in the loop. Like when will the human disappear? And that's like this whole um, notion, or I guess you could say question that people are answering with, with 
generative art. For those that don't know, it's like using AI and algorithms to make art. Um, and we'll touch upon NFTs in, in, a, in a few minutes, but um, Alema, you have a, a very awesome background um, and, and you studied, you know, science, technology, society at, at Stanford. Um, you have, you know, you hail from an amazing country. You have family in Samoa and Tonga. I would love to hear, you know, your journey and your perspective and, and just overall story into um, art and the realm of AI. Oh, I believe you're on mute. Hold on. Oh, give me a second, guys. Oh, you're still on mute, Alema. So sorry. Oh, there we go. Oh, it's all good. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Sweet. We got it. Um, yeah, I guess the question was just like my journey to art and AI. You were saying? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for sure. So um, hi, everyone. My name is Alam Fitzmanu. For those of you who probably don't know me, <laughs> I'm the co-founder and CTO of FLIR. And basically what we're building is um, basically a plat platform for anybody who wants to get into art can get into art and be validated in their in their tastes and in their um, what they want out of art. Uh, basically, uh, how I came to art, well, I came to art first kind of as like just out of pure enjoyment, out of my culture, like growing up in Samoa, I'd always like make stuff with like branches and leaves and stuff and just have a good time. And then once I got to Stanford, um, I really enjoyed my art practice courses and I did painting and photography mostly, but I felt like just the pure enjoyment of creating art and then having people appreciate it was something that like I just really loved and enjoyed. Um, it wasn't until actually like after or like during my senior year of Stanford, uh, where my two other co-founders, Riley Haig and Riley Clark, uh, kind of hit me up and said like, uh, we're making this company about making art accessible for everybody. And so I was like, oh, that's awesome. Like you two have a great time with that. Like, I hope you do well. <laughs> and then uh, going along the process and then I kind of realized um, how powerful artificial intelligence is and how I can make that experience, use that as a tool to make uh, experiencing art. Uh, more accessible for everybody and just using it as as uh, as a tool and so um, and at Stanford I didn't study like the practice of like coding AI and stuff like that but I feel like um, just as you're saying Alex it was an honor to like hear your performance and everything and just the question that you posed of like it's really us looking at us and so I feel like when I'm thinking about Fleur and designing like user experience and product and stuff like that, I really am trying to be intentional about, is this inviting for everyone? Is this fun? Is this going to create like some great conversations between us all? Um, and if we can get closer to that, I feel like that would, that would be a success for us. And so, um, yeah, I feel like I totally agree that like AI is what we make of it. And sometimes like when we're upset with AI, we're really just upset with ourselves. And so, like, and kind of just have to sit with that and work through that. Um, but I feel like it's all for the better and in, in becoming like improved over time. So yeah, thank you again for this opportunity. Oh no, of course, of course. I, I'm honored to have, you know, a conversation with you both. Um, you guys both touched on um, a concept of, you know, keeping humans in the loop and, and society, right? And, um, you know, for those that don't know or have never heard of, you know, algorithmic art or generative art, um, it's when you use AI to produce music or to create art, right? And there's this whole realm um, in the cryptocurrency slash web 3.0 space of non-fungible tokens or NFTs. Um, and, you know, for those that aren't, you know, in on the know in this in this concept, it's, it's a, an asset. It's a digital asset that you can buy. And you've seen this huge rush. It's almost like a gold rush, right? For creatives to, you know, make digital copies or, you know, um, render digital works um, and sell them, right? It's a new marketplace. What are your guys' thoughts on this? And, you know, Alema, particularly you with, with Floor.ai and making art accessible, um, you know, there's been, it's kind of gotten blown out of hand, um, in my opinion, that, you know, <laughs> some JPEGs of, of, you know, pixelated monkeys are selling for millions of dollars. <laughs> Um, and some, you know, musicians are, are minting their own. It's about access, right, and creating exclusivity. So I would love to know both of your guys', um, you know, opinions on this. And yeah, Alema, if you want to kick us off on that. Yeah, for sure. I feel like, and I feel like I'm in a similar boat of just like, it's just so new. And 
um, lots of people don't know what it is. And like, it can be, yeah, just kind of crazy to thinking like, oh, I'd pay for like this randomized monkey for millions of dollars. Um, mm -hmm. I think kind of um, like two things. One, I think, or like the technology of like NFTs or like knowing what belongs to who I feel like is really cool, that, that technology. But I feel like the real um, thing, and it's like juxtaposition with art is just that like, people have the honest questions like, why would you pay millions for that? And I think um, you're, what you're paying for is really like the access to like conversations or rooms or like certain parties and stuff like that. Um, but I feel like the real issue that like, I guess like Fleur specifically wants to get with art is just the point of access period, whether it's digital and NFTs or just like feeling intimidated walking into a gallery and not being able to feel like you're accepted or even like wanted wanted to be like invited into the gallery and stuff like that so really like that's the real issue that we're trying to get out with flirt is just of access and so we want to use artificial intelligence to kind of act as not really like the we're not selling artificial intelligence but just like it being a facilitator of saying like hey we noticed you like this uh we noticed that like you have white walls and that like you like um kind of like this color of art and stuff like that and really making people feel comfortable and whatever artistic taste that they have and making sure that they can be directed to people who appreciate that and that uh, want to support that. So yeah, that's kind of my two cents on NFTs. <laughs> I can't wait to check it out. I mean, you know, with my loud, colorful tastes and like obsession with tech, <laughs> what would Florida, that AI, you know, suggest for me? Alex, um, you as an artist and as a composer, musician, creator, like what is what is your take on this whole realm of digital assets and art? Well, and um, I'm, I have a double perspective because uh, two years ago when uh, the pandemic hit, I had just signed my um, uh, life, uh, the dream of a lifetime uh, record contract with uh, K7, which is a super amazing uh, record label based in Berlin. Um, and, and, and I just put my work out and, and I was starting my world tour and everything just blew away. And, uh, and, and with that, my, uh, um, income and my mortgage, my bills. And, and so I didn't know what to do. And so I called up a friend in the, that was living in the Silicon Valley, which was a, a mogul of streaming. And, uh, I explained my ideas of taking this crisis to, to, to take the opportunity to uh, um, take a leap forward into uh, performances. I, I mean, uh, live performances for uh, musicians um, has always been very, very left behind uh, in terms of innovation. Uh, I mean, artists uh, nowadays or before COVID, artists used to step on stage like it would do Elvis uh, uh, 70 years ago. So to me, that, uh, that's quite an acceptable being an experimental um, artist and uh, avant-gardist. So um, I, I, I was working into multimedia performances and immersive interactive performances since 10 years. Uh, and, and so we decided to build a whole environment uh, for artists to be able to do something different. And it is called A Live, which is the uh, startup uh, that I've founded and I'm the CEO and and now uh, we uh, we uh, stepped into the NFT market uh, really heavily because uh, uh, a live is actually the first platform that allows an artist to do the the whole package uh, in, in one environment you can step on stage produce your own NFT in real time as you perform and sell your own NFT uh, uh, and through an auction while you perform and, and when your concert is finished, they're all on, on the same um, environment. And I think, um, I think it's, it's mind blowing what's going on because for me as a digital artist, I've, I've always been considered myself a, a, a lower level artist uh, uh, in, in, in comparison to plastic artists. I can't produce a sculpture. I can't produce a painting. I don't know how to paint, but but my art is uh, meaningful as, as a painting. But before NFTs, I didn't have any ways to prove this. And, uh, and, 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 and then we, we enter another very philosophical concept, which is really important. Uh, uh, the internet and the social networks had uh, uh, lowered the value of everything that we produce in the digital world to nothing. 
nothing that we produce has a meaning anymore nothing is worth you don't pay for nothing because everything is free and if everything is free nothing is worth nothing and i can do the the lamest thing because then it, it doesn't cost anything it's free so let's just why don't show the picture of my ass to all, the whole world even if the whole world doesn't care i mean but that's that's taking away the whole perspective of karma in our life i mean we as human beings are shaped by every action that we do and if we do shit every day and all day long our life will be miserable and I'm not saying that NFT is going to cure this uh, thing, but it, is, it has brought a very, very sharp and fine and clever point to something specific. We can do something meaningful in the digital world. We can try to bring the meaning of life inside the digital world. And then there is a big bubble because there's people buying crypto kitties for two million uh, euros. But hey, that's, that's art. I mean, th th there was a, an artist in the 60s in Italy, very famous one, it was called Manzoni, and he put his shit in cans. He did a limited edition of artist's shit, and it sold for millions. And, and, and it was a, a super huge hit. But, but you know, people is buying shit. It, 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 we're buying shit in the 60s and they're buying shit nowadays uh, but uh, uh, but um, that is not the point of nfts nfts is just a technology it's just a framework and it is an amazing opportunity then there yeah. is a bubble of people exploiting it just to surf that wave that will explode sooner or later but we will be left with that technology and we will have the uh, huge uh, uh, um, challenge to make something meaningful in the digital world with that technology. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I 100% agree. And I think right now, like what we're seeing, as you mentioned, is a bubble. You know, it's 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 one thing. I you know I have a lot of artists in my community. I mainly hang out in like the digital collage space, um, you know, or the the mosaic space, right? And so many of my friends in these spaces are like, "Hey, you've done some M NFTs, you know." you know, for, for context, I, I've minted my own. It's all marketing if you don't have that network, right? Like if you're not a, a Banksy, right? And you can't just say like, oh yeah, sure, I'll, I'll you know, I'll mint some NFTs. And you have that network of people to promote you. Like it's very much like SEO, right? To kind of get people to sell your artwork. It's if you don't have that following, which brings me back to that question of access, right? Um, you know, like with Florida AI, it's, it's amazing that what you guys are building, Alema, like what are some, some trends that you guys are seeing with access and, you know, specifically with youth and youth in involvement in art and, you know, youth involvement with, with AI? Um, would love to hear your insights on that. No, yeah, for sure. Um, I guess just on terms of like, uh, in terms of like digital access, I feel like just like the youth in general seem to be like we're kind of moving into this trend of like uh, of looking at art online, um, being able to be exposed there. So I feel like that's like a big uh, point of access is that's like moving to like a more like online environment. Talking about like COVID, um, how that kind of changed Alex's um, uh, what's it called like trajectory for his like career. I feel like it kind of was the same with like um, our careers, like in the art market, like gallery spaces were closed. Um, lots of uh, traditional points of access were kind of like closed off. And so we kind of wanted to just kind of like force us to really think about like, okay, what are we going to do to increase access? And I feel like online is our chosen platform right now. Um, and just being able to, and then kind of like also being able to switch it to like kind of like a so more social aspect in order to increase access. Um, so it's not so much of a formal thing of like, I know this artist like for years and years and like my friends know this artist, um, but really just increasing access by means of like lowering the bar of just like, you go online, you're able to see art that like we've created for you at first and feel free to like, like it or not, or, and we'll get better with time with suggesting things, but you're able to feel like not intimidated by not having the sorts of family connections or sorts of like academic institutions to where you could really be um, access accessing these things. And then 
allowing people to start having like honest conversations. Um, for example, like if Lorne, your art was on, if your art was on Flare, like people um, might start off as strangers, but like over like the months of following you, like people might have like an honest question. It's like, Lorne, I've noticed you've been using this sort of motif in your, your paintings. Can you tell us more about that? Or um, I've noticed that like uh, it really resonates like with this audience and why do you think that is? And so um, I feel like just focusing on that point of accessibility, of that social aspect that everyone has to offer, um, people can be uh, more, feel more comfortable in the art market. Um, so yeah, I guess that's what we're trying to do with Flirt, yeah. Yeah, no, and that's one thing that, you know, I've seen with a lot of digital art. I mean, there's this app called Wombo.ai, you know, where you can literally um, just type in, and if you download it, it's also like on desktop, you type in a few keywords and it, and it just generates, you know, a digital piece of artwork that kind of looks pretty psychedelic. You can do different features. And I know that's blown up on TikTok amongst, oh, shoot. <laughs> amongst the Gen Z users for those that want to test it out. But I mean, you know, um, how there's there's still like quite a bit of, of a learning gap, right? For you know, people hear AI and they think like, oh my gosh, I don't have a computer science background, like I don't code, you know, um, but I want to get into this like algorithmic art or I want to try it out. Or um, there are even a handful of tools, you know, like OpenAI, one of the top you know AI research uh, institutes in the world in San Francisco, released a few years ago, MuseNet. And MuseNet was um, a music uh, or AI powered um, music neural network, right, for people to test out. But one thing that I started to notice was you needed those technical skills to actually like learn how to manipulate this. And so, Alex, I would I would love to hear your take on, you know. Um, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really skeptical on uh, um, everything that comes with generative uh, uh, AI and, and art uh, because I, I really, really uh need the human approach uh, inside every art gestures uh, and this is very has a very very simple uh, uh meaning it, it is because uh, uh, ai does not produce art ai it's a machine and, and it, it produces uh datas so it, it doesn't produce meaning um so it, it can produce imitation uh, but it, it will never know why those two colors mean something to you, it means uh, uh, love, death, uh, pain, uh, joy, sex, sweat, uh, fear of death, why I am composing uh, and writing uh, a C sharp after an A uh, and then a G. Uh, and artificial intelligence will never know that. So. If you take away the human factor, there's no art anymore. It's just a, a craftsmanship. So let's let's separate the two worlds. Uh, in in terms of accessibility, um, the, the, it is a, a, there's a lot of gap uh, in 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 learning. Just but just in learning the, the philosophical concept of what you can achieve with that. Uh, with AIMINT, we started to teach uh, 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 artificial intelligence in classical conservatories. So before the pandemic hit, I would uh, go in tour and uh, uh, play a concert and then do a masterclass and a workshop the day after or the day before inside the classical conservatory. And it was beautiful to see how this is, is resonating with, with people studying classical instruments, because to me, artificial intelligence is the new classical instrument, is the new pianoforte, is the new cello. It, it's, you know, uh, it, it doesn't, um, uh, there's no point for me now to make classical music with ancient instruments, you know, you know playing classical music, that doesn't mean to play uh, old ancient instruments. It, it just means to play meaningful, powerful music. So that's one thing. And the other thing we're doing with A Live, for instance, is to uh, regain accessibility for the live performances, which is a thing that we've lost during the pandemic. And so in Italy, for instance, we were the first to rebuild the, the whole live industry, uh, setting up a huge concert in September 2020 when everything was completely shut down. We held, we took the Arena di Verona, which is one of the biggest uh, monuments uh, uh, in Italy, um, and, and we put 45 of the most uh, famous bands and artists in Italy to perform there. And that was a, a blast, a Copernican revolution uh, in terms of uh, 
accessibility to music uh, in, in, in both for artists and for the fans because it was uh, an instant access to new emotions and now that everything hopefully is uh, um it's going uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not saying out loud but it, it seems that the the the, the virus is uh, is giving us a, a break um we are really working on on a new uh, trend that we really strongly believe that it's the digital trend. It's the mixture of the the, the physical um, the, the, the physical experience and the digital experience. So, what we are taking with us after these two years of uh, uh, changes in chaos and stuff like that, it's a, a radical change in the language. And the digital language is, I think, is the one of the most contemporary thing that we can carry on, and and everything will be more and more and more integrated. And so, for instance, with a live, we're working a lot on, into bringing the digital experience inside the real uh, uh, concert, physical concert, and that that works amazingly because it opens up accessibility, possibility, artistic. Uh, uh expansion of languages and creative capabilities for all the stakeholders a new stream of revenues that can come from the digital world so uh, it is uh, you know it is a super amazing and exciting revolution and uh, we have to uh, just uh, use a lot of mindfulness to uh, to go in the right direction Sure. I couldn't agree more. Um, and speaking on that, like of what you mentioned about conservatories, we have actually a really interesting question from one of my AI Future Lab colleagues, Nupur. Um, and she asks, is AI and music and AI and art already part of music colleges or art schools? Um, and if youths want to learn about these topics, like what do you do and where can they learn? Um, would love to anyone want to take this? Hear your guys thoughts well I, I can i can take it yes i mean there is uh um i, I we cannot uh, do a, a, a generalized uh, answer i mean there's a very uh, open minded and visionary uh, school institutions that have uh, integrated uh, artificial intelligence into their uh, school plans and there's other that are completely ignoring it so um, th th there's a, a um, one thing that I really want to say that we didn't say before about the, 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 the danger of artificial intelligence, which is not danger, but it's the danger of humanity, is every time we jump into a major leap forward in technology, there is going to be a gap where people do not understand really well what's going on, do not understand the tool that they have in their hands. And there's, a, and there's a lot of people that are going to use it wisely, a lot of people that are not going to use that wisely. And this is going to create tensions, frictions, victims, and uh, winners and losers. But this is endemic in our history. And uh, artificial intelligence will put us through the same exact same process. Uh, which doesn't mean that artificial intelligence is bad. It means that we do not uh, go towards knowledge full throttle. We are ignorant, uh, uh, an ignorant species. Uh, humanity is not uh, 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 lean towards knowledge. It's lean towards uh, material pleasure. So this is what takes, takes us away from all the amazing possibilities that are mind and body and world could give us so um it, in this gap there are schools that don't make uh, uh, ai accessible because they adverse artificial intelligence and there are schools that push it forward because uh, there's uh, uh, wise people uh, wise professors that integrate it into the uh, programs yeah a lemma what yeah. about <laughs> no yeah for sure um i guess like uh just thinking about it like when i was growing up and learning about like art for the first time like it was hard even like accessing like a computer let alone like artificial intelligence and so it was 
um, I kind of resonate really with that question of just like, where can they learn? And some people, some places don't have as many resources as others. Um, just talking about like um, my co-founders and I like going to Stanford. Um, I think from lots of our professors, there is like a great push for like artificial intelligence, digital media. Uh, they're really like pioneering that effort. Um, but sometimes in terms of like art history and kind of like the academy per se, like there is resistance towards like using artificial intelligence and that um, they're afraid that like, oh, like we'll lose our humanity or like, oh, we'll like, we'll, we'll lose respect for the things that we've done so far when that's really what we don't want to happen with like FLIR. And just to, just to clarify, like FLIR isn't used to like generate any art or is an AI generating art. It's just matching artists, using AI to match artists with um, art lovers. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, um, what's it called? Like with FLIR, we want to bridge that gap using artificial intelligence, not to take away from anyone's humanity or the art that they've already created, but really just to be a connector to make those interactions between uh, people and artists like more accessible and easier and um, hopefully to be more intentional about where artificial intelligence continues to go. And I really agree with Alex, really sitting down with ourselves and really watching, um, we've seen this as Alex said, this pattern of technology really leaving people behind. But I feel like um, then it's our responsibility to make that not happen again. So I feel like, uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, definitely, definitely agree. And, you know, it's there's a lot of really good resources online, obviously, especially thanks to the, the pandemic. There's AIartist.org, which has like a almost an everything you ever wanted to know guide about like AI and art, AI and music resources. Um, in fact, I just stumbled upon that website a few months ago and saw that um, NYU. I'll have to use that. <laughs> Ah, yeah, no, check it out. Everyone check it out. It's like AIartist.org, I believe. Um, and I, you know, I didn't know, I was trying to figure out like what universities, you know, and obviously like when I think about AI and art, I think, okay, Stanford obviously like already has a program. <laughs> um, but like NYU has been pouring a ton of, of resources into building out, um, you know, artificial intelligence art and artificial intelligence visual arts and um, and music as well, and even like stage theater. And so it's great to see these resources being pulled into, uh, poured into, you know, preserving this, but also like opening up more access. One question I have um, for you both is, is how do we, you know, Alex, you mentioned like the importance of humanity, like at the center of creativity or creation, right? Like, how do we preserve different cultures? So one example, and what I mean by that is, um, there are a lot of um, you know, researchers or even just artists now that have indigenous backgrounds, um, whether they're trying to preserve their, their um, Native American languages or whether they're trying to preserve um, or, or, or create art for the purpose of activism. How do, what do you guys think in terms of how AI and art can help different cultures or is it a hindrance of, of certain cultures? Um, would love to hear your guys' thoughts on that. Well, to me, uh, you know, as, as, for me, playing with artificial intelligence means to play augmented art. I play augmented music, which I think it's the best uh, uh, tag and label that defines my genre, uh, uh, augmented vision and augmented music. Because what my artificial intelligence delivers is an, an augmented version of me on stage. So um, if you see in that perspective, uh, uh, whoever uses AI in a mindful way with a, a human-centric approach can expand and dig deeper into his universal uh, world of uh, um, roots and legacy and heritage. So it doesn't uh, it doesn't necessarily means that because we are translating our actions and our emotions into data to amplify the, the thing that we lose the uh, specificity of what we feel of where we belong and, and, and so um i don't know if i'm making myself clear but it's just it's just a tool that if i use it to amplify my own music whoever uses it for a cause for a, a very specific uh, um regional uh niche of art 
can use it to expand that, which does not mean to expand it in an horizontal way towards globalization. It means to expand it into a vertical way towards universe and the atom of our inner self. Yeah, super powerful. <laughs> I, oh, I got to <laughs> <laughs> um, Amazing. Alema, what yeah. about culture preservation? Um, so are you asking like what can like NFTs or like AI do to um, yeah, preserve yeah. culture? Yes, exactly. Yeah, um, I guess, so just to give context, so my family is indigenous to the South Pacific, um, Samoa and Soma in the South Pacific. Um, and I think like just talking about what Alex was saying about like ownership of like digital assets and stuff like that, I feel like um, we can kind of see this in museums and stuff like that where indigenous artifacts were taken and scanned and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And so I feel like NFTs could be useful in the sense that like this belongs to this certain tribe or this group of people to be used as a cultural um, thing that isn't just replicated in for uses that um, are that our tribe or culture like doesn't want to be used for. And so I feel like that could be really helpful. Um, in terms of uh, artificial intelligence, I feel like I, um, just thinking about like my island home, like I feel like there's tons of ways we can use artificial intelligence. Like I just wish like we had like so much more uh, technology sometimes in Samoa to measure like wave patterns or to measure like uh, crops and all, all that sorts of stuff. I feel like that can be totally useful. Um, I think that um, it'll take time to build access to that, but I'm really looking forward to how we can use that to benefit our indigenous communities so that they can continue to thrive and like, create new ideas and, and new uses for it. So I feel like uh, just with time, uh, we can do that. And so, um, yeah, looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, no, and like what, that's one thing that we've been talking about here all day is like, you know, AI is a tool, right? And, you know, there's this whole, whole boy, you know, it's, it's, I mean, very much as like Alex, you know, we saw in his performance is like the hammer. It, it's the human behind the hammer, right? Like it's the humans behind the AI. And, you know, which leads me to the whole topic of bias, right? Like, you know, it's not perfect. Um, mm -hmm. And it's humans behind it. And like, it is improving, obviously, um, you know, so what are your guys' thoughts in terms of um, bias within AI and, and the whole realm of art? Um, you know, there, it's something that, is trying to be reduced um but you know again it kind of also plays back into the whole you know topic of access but would love to hear you guys um you guys thoughts on that mm -hmm. take first. <laughs> oh i i can go first um i think this is something that's like heavily on our minds like with blur, blur ai it's like thinking about about using it sorry <laughs> when we're using um ai we're thinking about like which artists do we recommend like do we just recommend the artists that are popular today and that would kind of be like kind of skewed because like if you just took the demographics of a successful artist today, um, they might skew to one population over another for like obvious like traditional reasons of like racism and um, and other things. And so it's really important that we look at like our data sets and be able to um, not like blame the AI, but blame like our choices of using this certain data set and creating new data sets or um, just basing it off of other factors that are more um, accurate as to like how um, quality like a work is and stuff like that. So I feel like we're definitely um, thinking about that at FLIR and uh, definitely wanting to make it right by everybody. So yeah. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. Alex, what about you? Any thoughts on, on bias, especially? Yeah, well, uh, that's, I think what we've, We've been talking a lot about that in, in the last hour. I mean, that's my main concern. And so uh, it, it, is, it is really important uh, um, to keep in mind that we, um, as, as technology goes on, uh, everything becomes faster. So um, we spoke about the, the, the cycles and the loops of history, and it is true and it is correct. And I really believe that theory, otherwise I wouldn't have said that, but it is also correct and right that every, every cycle goes faster and it spreads out wider and faster and faster and super fast uh, in now in, in our connected uh, era. So um, the risk now that that gap we were talking about before of people being 
uh, losers and winners uh, uh, goes into a sh short circuit and and, and goes uh, bananas it, it it is high so we need to take uh, we need to take this really careful that is why it is uh, um, it, it, it is a, a constant work of creating awareness on uh, the possibilities and uh, a, um, a, 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 a something to make us think about how we behave. It is also, you know, the bias on artificial intelligence, it is a bias on ourselves uh, and, and our, our life, the way we, we decide to lead our life. Uh, there's, there's a lot of way for solving problems uh, in our life. And, and it is uh, not uh, um, stopping progress, stopping research uh, and not using technology. The way to solve problems is to start acting with mindfulness and that will take away all the bias all the problems uh, everything will just go uh, straight into one uh, lane which is the lane of uh, light and uh, uh, righteous uh, things to do so for me it is you know we, we could we could talk for the whole night about uh, uh, how we should use the data, as, uh, how, uh, how we should uh, not uh, use something, not to be too extreme on that, a little bit less on that. But it's, it's never going to go away if we don't uh, go to the source of all the problems, which is us. So um, uh, to cut a long story short, uh, it, it, we, don't, we, should, we should take AI as a... Um, as a metaphor to go and dive deep into ourselves and, and analyze how we're living, how we're treating uh, uh, the planet, nature, uh, the resources that we have, the, the, the existential resources that we have, which is the people that are around us. So if we live exploiting those resources, uh, even before AI, you can imagine what you can do with AI. If you live uh, with a respectful way, you, you probably get an AI and you do something good. So, yep. it, you know, with, with an AI, for instance, uh, and the, the, there's a lot of uh, um, talking going on about the AI that recognizes uh, a, the, the, the uh, fac facial expressions and can, you know, that, that it's a super powerful tool for doctors to monitor uh, patients in hospitals. And it's, a, it's amazing, but that's also an evil tool to sell you more products if you do window shopping. So um, is that tool bad or good? Yeah. That's, that's my answer for you. Right. Yeah. <laughs> answer <laughs> this. Is that, tool, is that tool good or bad? Let me get back to you on that. <laughs> <laughs> I realize... It's, it's as simple as that. Just, yeah. <laughs> I realize we have a few minutes left and, and I wanted to open up uh, questions to the audience. If you have a burning question uh, for Alema or Alex or myself, um, feel free to pop it into the chat um, you, while, while we have them here. Um, you know, don't be shy, anyone. Um, and I guess- yeah, Feel like, free to ask. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, oh, Saif, do you have a, a question? Hi, Saif. I'm just gonna mute myself because it's faster. <laughs> hey Alex, I I loved all your contributions and Alema, thank you for making the time. And I couldn't possibly agree with you more. I love that we're ending actually the entire conference with this because personally, I believe that the reason why AI is showing up now because it's asking us fundamental questions about who we are as humans. You know, it's it's uh, telling us as humans we replaced uh, our, our our arm and our bodies with with uh, with robots and machines. And with AI replaced our mind, uh, and all that we're left with is our heart as humans. And who are we as humans if all we have is our heart? So my question to you is, um, you know, on the outside you look like an artist, uh, but it seems that your calling it just it manifests as art. But what? How would you phrase your calling, if I may ask you that question? What do you believe is your calling on planet Earth? Uh, is that for me? Yes. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, that's for you, Alex. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
uh, in a very simple way, um, I mean, uh, and it goes back to what I was saying before, um, everything goes down to what we do in the next five minutes. Uh, so think, uh, think hugely and amazingly big, but then act very shortly, well, and with mindfulness. So if you can keep that in your mind, you will reach two goals. You live the present, which is the only important thing to do. And you can tackle any crisis because you take it step by step. So you think about the next 30 seconds and you behave good for the next 30 seconds. And then 30 seconds on 30 seconds on 30 seconds, you'll make your life a whole better. And if you do make your life better, you will make the life better of, the, of your neighbor. And if you do make the life better of your neighborhood and your neighborhood does the same, it's the swarm intelligence concept. Why do swarms behave like that? Because every single member of a swarm just cares about his proximity and thinks about his next five seconds not to crash on his neighbor. So that's how I should and I would tackle everything. But um, and very simple, simple as that. Amazing. Um, and then I see another question from Saif to Alema. Any commentary about the connection between AI and indig indigeneity? Yeah. Um, well, again, like, thank you, Alex, for that answer. Like, I feel like that was just awesome. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> uh, but in connecting AI and indig indig indigeneity, I think. I think about like my ancestors a lot and thinking about like ways that they had to manufacture like new technology. Like Alex talked about like the hammer. Like I think about like we would use like tattoo tools or other sorts of like equipment to like navigate our way forward. And I feel like it's kind of the same with AI. Um, like our schools might not be there yet in terms of technical ability, but I feel like the mindset is always the same of using it as a tool to make have our communities prosper and to use it to, for the betterment of our world really um and yeah i think that's pretty much what i what keeps me going and learning more about ai and seeing like what could could be next um and just again inspiring our youth to and empowering them with better tools than we had before and continuing to build and build and so um yeah just continue with that <laughs> Yeah. Well, uh, wow. Amazing, guys. Thank you so much for like the multiple mic drops, Alex. <laughs> um, super exciting and super honored. Um, oh, I see one last question um, from Nippur. No worries, Nippur, um, if you guys have a couple of minutes to, to hang around. Um, her question is, every artist likes to be appreciated. How can we increase the appreciation for AI artists and maybe also the visibility? I know that Alex was part of the lineup of the Amsterdam dance event, but not every artist may get such exposure. Ooh. Wow. Um, well, uh, I think at the moment, uh, um, the one good thing about social networks, uh, which is, uh, uh, it is exactly like, that one that can give you the exposures and the window that you need and and then it comes down to what matters which is the content and what you do so if what you do is meaningful um it, it, there is a, a very high chance that you break through and you make it through i didn't i didn't reach the um Ars Electronica uh, festival uh, out of the blue. It took me years and years and years and years and years of uh, uh, nothing before getting there. Um, so uh, it, it, the, the point is, uh, what is that matters? It, does it matter to have success? Mm. No. It matters to do something meaningful because that something meaningful is meaningful for you that make that meaningful things. That is what shapes your life. And if you go following that direction, you will find that becoming successful, it's not a theme anymore. As long as you can make a living out of it, 
which is a very different thing than being successful. It's a totally different thing. Everything should be fine in your life. Then, or vice versa, if you chase success, and you don't do meaningful things to you just because you think you have to accomplish someone else's taste. And that's where the problems start because you will feel frustrated if you don't reach success because you, 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 don't, you don't sense any meaning into that. Mm -hmm. So um, if you can fill your life with meaningfulness, success is it's not a theme uh, because your life would be self-sufficient yeah yeah couldn't 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 do that any any clearer <laughs> than you did alex and and just just like one quick final note like that's one thing you're seeing about this gold rush of of artists and nfts people are like minting their nfts it's costing them a hundred hundred plus dollars just to mint them on the ethereum um framework and nobody's buying and there's this like large i don't know if you've been on any of the art um nft subreddits but like people are angry and people are like hey what the hell like you know i i'm entitled to having people buy my nfts why am i not making millions you know like the pixelated ape <laughs> and, and it's that question of like what are you in it for like what is your intention when you make art you know i've made art to help for emotional healing and for like mental health outlets like I didn't do that to, to become an influencer or make a side hustle like a lot of, you know, people do in this generation. And I think that's really important and maybe something for us to all keep in mind um, in the days to come. Oh, I have one last question. I'm so sorry, speakers. Um, let, let can, me I just, can, I just, can I just say one thing about the, uh, what you just said, uh, just really quickly? Um, it, is, uh, it is very wrong to spend that much amount of money to mint NFT on a, <laughs> a, a very costly blockchain and a very uh, inefficient and dirty in terms of uh, climate change blockchain as Ethereum. So yeah. if you're an artist and you want to mint your NFT and you don't have a market, go get uh, uh, Polygon, go get EOS, go get another blockchain that doesn't cost anything, doesn't hurt the environment, and it doesn't cost you money. So again, it's not the NFT. It's the the artist mindset that is corrupted. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Well, sorry, I'm I'm being monotonous. <laughs> sorry, but it, 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 it all comes down to very simple, basic things. Offering <laughs> of knowledge, and you're sharing resources, right? Like that's what we all. Okay, last question. I'm not lying. I promise. Um, from Kasmir, he has a question saying some people are afraid to dive into AI in Africa because they feel that AI will take away the job which is not enough to some in Africa. So how can you convince them that AI is not taking away the jobs from them? Well, Emma, I, I see you ruminating. <laughs> no, yeah, I feel, uh, it's a difficult question because I feel like a lot of the burden is on like, well, especially like on me as like a founder of a company and a startup that if we're going to be using AI, then how are we going to be like retraining people to do other things that AI can't do and being able to uh, what's it called? compensate them for that. And so I feel like, again, like as Alex said, like sometimes technology can just like leave people behind, but I feel like we shouldn't, we shouldn't use this as like, oh, people are just gonna be left behind. Like that's too bad. Like we should be actively trying to be mindful and to be really thinking about, yeah, and it's impacts like the physical people who are gonna maybe like have to like switch careers or do, do something different. Um, but really keeping them, making sure that we're taking care of the communities that we're like either physically in, if we have like an office space that we're hiring people from or like in other like markets as well. So that's what, that's what I'm thinking about. Yeah. <laughs> and, and just to, to add to that, um, there's these whole, you know, co continent wide initiatives like the Indaba X initiative, which is like pan-African centric. Like how can we make sure that if this is not only like in Accra or Lagos, but like into the rest of the other countries within Africa. And I know Tim Net Gebru, who is like one of my heroes in AI, uh, AI ethicist, uh, formerly at Google, but now the, the co-founder of the Decentralized AI Research Institute. Um, you know, she's making it sure that like the digital access and digital literacy gaps are, are being filled by people in, you know, all different uh, countries, not just 
the tech ecosystems um, of Africa or a certain continent. So that is top of mind, um, Kashmir, and, and something to say. Okay, I don't want to take up anyone's anyone's um, more time. I really, really appreciate this. Um, you guys sharing your insights, uh, Alema and Alex. I can't say thank you enough. Maybe one of these days in Rome, or whenever you guys are based, we can all congregate. Um, that will be fantastic. That will be fantastic. <laughs> And thank you for the opportunity. It's amazing to share uh, meaningful things and uh, to um, hear so many amazing stories from you. Thank you very much. Yes, and, and thank you, Alex, and thank you, Lorne. It's been awesome. Thank you so much. And this is the last session of the Youth and the Future of AI conference. So we're closing it out. So thank you to everyone who participated and um, we'll be posting recordings and, and follow-ups uh, afterwards. Again, thank you everyone for coming and have a great weekend. Take care. Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you, bye everybody. Bye. Happy Friday. Bye -bye. <laughs>